This is art history from a queer perspective. We're talking about Oz tonight. So let's get right into it finally. And let's, this is from an article I wrote in Gay Journal. Let's face it, J.K. Rowling's anti-LGBT rants, absurd justifications for hate, refusal to list, listen to facts, and her just plain cruel responses have ruined the fantasy world of Harry Potter for many of the folks of the LGBT community. It certainly has for me. No wonder those books are so fixed in unbending gender roles. It's over, JK. It's over. <laughs> All right. So now what are we going to do? What are we going to do now? What do we do now without a fantasy world where queer differences are accepted and celebrated? Well, luckily, we have Oz, the queer visitors from the marvelous land of Oz. <laughs> and queer, you'll see in the Oz books all over the place. Let me tell you. In fact, this is a page from a comic strip that was uh, a comic page that was in newspapers in, in 1904 that uh, L. Frank Baum wrote. And by the way, there's a lot of queerness in the world of Oz. There definitely is. Uh, I am also an Oz purist. And so I have to say that uh, read, you can read that as obsessive, as you'll see. Um, I won't be talking about Wicked. I don't even know the guy who wrote Wicked. And it's not that I have anything against Wicked, not that there's anything wrong with that. But um, I don't understand that. I don't know anything about revisionist stuff or later fan fiction. I am the pure, I am a purist about Oz. Not that there's anything wrong with that. Okay, so. Uh, who are you? We're friends of Dorothy, right? <laughs> yes, we are. Yes, we are. We're friends of Dorothy. We're going to learn where that came from. So Oz, we're talking about. Here's L. Frank Baum, and he was the author that wrote The Wizard of Oz. Lyman Frank Baum was his name, and he lived from 18, uh, 1856 to 1919. And here he is as a younger man. Just as my voice is too strained at the beginning, I get so excited. I just want to tell you. <laughs> and he wrote The Wonderful World of Oz in 1900. That's when the year that the book came out. <clears throat> and here it is. This is the first uh, and uh, first edition cover. And uh, it was extraordinarily popular. Um, it is the most significant Mer American story of all time. And I am unabashedly and biasedly saying that, but I think it's true. And this is why I think it's true. Among other things, this movie, and this movie is extraordinarily influential. In fact, the American Film Institute has ranked it 11th as the most influential movie of all time. Um, but I bet you can't quote a line from the first 10. And here are the first 10. Can you quote a line from any of those? Maybe Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs. But if you can quote a line from the Battleship Potemkin, I will be surprised. <laughs> if you can, you get a raffle ticket, yeah. Or even from Dracula for, you know, very specific line from the original, original, uh, or modern times. Yes, hi ho, hi ho, I'm off to work to go. I will give you that for, for, for the snow one. So you can you can have Austin can have a ticket for saying hi ho, hi ho. Um, that's definitely the case. But here's what one in three. So this is what I want to say about the Wizard of Oz. Whenever Trish and I are watching TV or something, I always say something like Oz reference, and and it happens all the time. One in three books, TV shows, movies reference Oz all the time. Here is like over the rainbow. Here's some things that come up with regard to Oz that you hear all the time. Over the rainbow. Toto, I have a feeling we're not in Kansas anymore. People saying we're not in Kansas anymore. Um, <clears throat> are you a good witch or a bad witch? Uh, my, my, people come and go so quickly here. Before somebody drops a house on you, people talk about dropping a house on people all the time. Of course, some people po do go both ways. Uh, that's the scarecrow said that. Some people without brains do an awful lot of talking. I'll get you, my pretty. And your little dog, too. People say that all the time. Lions and tigers and bears, oh my. That cadence you see constantly. And it's a reference to us. Um, yeah, yeah. Right, I said that up there. This is the second one. 
Run, Toto, run. Run, Toto, run. How about this? I'm melting. I'm melting. What a world. What a world. Um, that Pay no attention to that man behind the curtain. You hear that all the time. They say it politically all the time. Um, I don't know. I can't come back. I don't know how it works. And the ruby slippers, click your heels together three times. You can't just click your th heels together three times. And there's no place like home. And that came from a song. Certainly, there's no place like home. But the idea of saying that to be able to get home is a significant thing that came from the movie, The Wizard of Oz. And of course, these characters, these important characters, there they are. And this, <laughs> Surrender Dorothy. Now, <clears throat> directly from L. Frank Baum's imagination, this is stuff he thought up. And there's, this is from The Wizard, from the, the Wizard of Oz, the actual first book, The Cyclone, Traveling by cyclone, um, uh, Kansas being a metaphor for dull stuff. People say that all the time. We're not in Kansas anymore. Uh, come on, it's true. And um, you know, like what are you live in Kansas? And he made he made it through that way. You know, Kansas lived in the in the broad or uh, Dorothy lived in the broad prairie, and and she talked about how everything was dull and dusty, and there was no color. There's Aunt Em and Uncle Henry, <clears throat> the scarecrow. The Tin Man, Toto, the Cowardly Lion, and the Yellow Brick Road. All of those came out of his imagination. The Munchkins, yes, Dunkin' Donuts. You would not have Munchkins were it not for L. Frank Baum. The Humbug Wizard. He was a humbug wizard. And the Flying Monkeys. Don't let me, don't make me unleash the Flying Monkeys. And, and Glinda here, uh, Glinda the Good Witch. And the fighting trees. So that thing in the movie actually came from his own idea about the fighting trees, which is in The Wizard of Oz. And the Wicked Witch of the West, the Wicked Witch of the West, even the stockings that the Wicked Witch of the West wears, those red and white stripes are a, a, a thing that's an icon that represents witches. The Emerald City, all of those things. Now, L. Frank Baum wrote The Wizard of Oz when he was 44 years old in 1900. He had a lot of unsuccessful careers before that. He was a fancy chicken breeder. He sold door-to-door -door China. He, he owned a general store. He was a journalist. He was a magazine publisher. publisher. He sold fireworks. Um, he was an actor. Luckily, he married Maud Gage, and who left Cornell College in 1882. It was the only college in the United States that took women at the time. She was studying law. She was 21, and she fell in love with him and she left college to be with him. He was 26 at the time. And her mother thought this was a big mistake. He's an impractical dreamer. He's gonna be unable to support the family. And in some ways that was somewhat true. Here's Maud Gage. Maud Gage was a bit of a, let me say, I don't know if she was as much of a shrew as she was the boss, the boss of the household. And it's a good thing because he was extraordinarily extravagant with money. And she strongly controlled the finances and kept them from constant poverty. Here's a little story. She says to him one day, did you buy a dozen giant expensive donuts? And he says, uh, well, yeah, I, I like donuts for breakfast. And she says, this is true. You are always doing this. No other food until you eat all the donuts. <laughs> so the next morning, so he, she, she gives him donuts for lunch and for dinner. And the next morning and the lunch, because, it, you know, and in the 1880s, they didn't have preservatives. So the, the donuts are pretty stale by the next day. And he says he doesn't want to eat these. So he puts them in the garbage and she goes and takes them out of the garbage and puts them back on his plate. And so he, he struggles through another one. And then that night he takes them and he buries them in the backyard and she digs them up and puts them on his plate. And the thing is that he told this story as an amusing story to everyone he met because he wanted people to understand that she was taking care of them. And she was really impressed by that. He loved her very, very much. And um, they had four sons and she also worked because he often, um, made mistakes and lost all their money. So she, uh, and there weren't a lot of jobs for women in those days, particularly married women who had children. So, and in their level of class. So she ended up teaching other women how to do beautiful embroidery. And she did that a lot and it, it gave them enough money. She was an ardent 
suffragist. And Frank, Frank Baum, L. Frank Baum, was also absolutely 100% committed to women's suffrage as well. The reason that she was committed to suffrage because her mother was Matilda Jocelyn Gage. Matilda Jocelyn Gage was a significant suffragist. She was one of the top three. Can everybody hear me okay? Should I make this a little louder? You're okay? She was, she was one of the top three suffrage women in the United States. And here are Elizabeth Cady Stanton and Susan B. Anthony. And she worked directly with them to write the History of Women's Suffrage, which was a very, very significant book in the, in the late 1800s. She publicly worked constantly for suffrage uh, every day. That was her thing. There she is. Now, this picture is tough looking. Look at this woman. She is hot. I think she's hot in this picture, particularly compared to Susan B. Anthony. I mean, no, no. I mean, you know, Susan B. Anthony, many people said that she was a lesbian and um, and she's on our money and everything. But Maude Gage looks like she could command a room. I really think or, uh, Matilda Gage looks like that. She was far more radical than Elizabeth Cady Stanton and Susan B. Anthony. And in fact, she broke with them because they wanted to tie suffrage to temperance, meaning to prohibition, and also to eliminating church, said the separation of church and state. That was part of their effort with regard to um, having women be able to have the vote. And so Maud, uh, Matilda Gage created the Women's National Liberal, Liberal Union. She served as its president up until a month before her death. And she ended up uh, campaigning for women's rights and the, the vote without tying it to these other things, which are really very um, questionable in terms of, of uh, autonomy. And she also campaigned for Native American rights, which is important to remember because uh, that comes up again. Um, she was an abolitionist and she also campaigned for three, free thought. So free thought means that within religion, you can be self-determinate and, and to interpret the religion yourself. That's kind of what free thought meant. So she was really cutting edge. And L. Frank Baum very much um, revered her and, and respected her greatly. Um, the Matilda effect was named for her versus the Matthew effect. Does anybody know what the Matilda effect is? Now we are all going to learn. This is actually a thing. You can look it up. <clears throat> she wrote a book called Women as Inventors. And the Matilda effect that she uh, denoted in this book was that if a person invents something who is not very famous or who is a woman, the effect of the invention, no matter how fabulous it is, is diminished. It's just not seen as the, as the most important thing because it was invented by this person. The Matthew effect is the opposite. This person uh, invented this, so it must be great and we're gonna give it more accolades than it deserves. Um, so it's interesting and that's based on her stuff. L. Frank Baum named his son, his second son, Robert Stanton Baum. He was actually uh, uh, somewhat related, uh, remotely related to Elizabeth Cady Stanton, but he really named um, Robert Stanton Baum after Elizabeth Cady Stanton because he thought very highly of her as a suffragist. And Susan B. Anthony regularly visited their home. So he was right in the thick of the suffrage movement. There he is again. And uh, Matilda Gage spent about six months a year with Maude and Frank, and this was not a bad thing because she had money and they didn't always have money. So she would often uh, pay, help to pay for their rent and, and circumstances like that. And one day she said to Frank Baum, these stories you're telling the boys, because remember they have four sons, maybe publish them. And he says, you think? Huh. So he does. And she actually lent him money to be able to do that. And, her uh, five-month-old granddaughter, Dorothy Gage, was born in Bloomington, Illinois. Hannah and Rachel, she was born in Bloomington, Illinois. Uh, Hannah and Rachel are in Bloomington and are watching this. And this little girl, uh, who was five months old, died in 1898, which was right before uh, uh, The Lizard of Oz came out. And Maude, his wife, was bereft because she only had boys and she really loved this little girl baby. 
And so he honored his wife's grief by naming the protagonist of his books, Dorothy Gale, after Dorothy Gage. And she's buried in Bloomington. And this is a monument to Dorothy there in the, in the, um, in the graveyard there in Bloomington. So we will be going to see that the next time we go to Bloomington, Illinois, where we go frequently. Baum wrote 13 more books after The Wizard of Oz. So if you didn't know that, now you know. This is a big deal. And <clears throat> so there were 13 books as his part of the Oz, Oz series. And when The Wizard of Oz came out, it cost $1.50. That's a lot of money for those days. $1.50 was a big deal. And yet, <clears throat> these books came out every year, and, and kids really looked forward to getting them. At least eight other books he wrote about other fairylands around Oz. In fact, he was a hack writer. He lo wrote loads and loads of books. He wrote under lots of different names and stuff. But he wrote about Oz and he wrote about fairylands around Oz a great deal. Uh, there's Ozma of Oz, and we're going to be talking about that several times. So pay attention to Ozma of Oz. Remember that. Now, I just want to throw in here in the books, it's not a dream. It's not a dream. That thing of waking up at the end, that's from the movie. It is not a dream in the books. And in fact, <clears throat> in subsequent books in the series, it's absolutely written as though it's a really real place, just as Dorothy says in the, in the movie. But it really is a really real place. Dorothy goes back to Oz, and the wizard goes back to Oz. And Dorothy becomes a princess, and, and the wizard becomes a real wizard. And does anybody know what happens to Aunt Em and Uncle Henry? There's a, oh, this was prize worthy. Yes. What happened? Yes, they move to Oz too. Give yourself an extra ticket. Very well done. They move to Oz too. Actually, what happens is that, and this is a fantasy of a poor child. Um, in, in the Emerald City of Oz, which is actually the first Oz book I ever re read, um, Uncle Henry and Aunt Em say to Dorothy, we don't have any money. We're going to lose the farm. We don't know what to do. And Dorothy says, you know, I'm a princess in Oz. Mm -hmm. And they say, okay. And, and she says, I can show a magic symbol because they're going to look at me through the magic picture and I'll go to Oz. And they say, well, you should do it because we don't have any money and we're going to lose the farm and we don't have any food and you should do it. She goes up to her garret bedroom and they look a few minutes later and she's gone. And once she gets to Oz, she tells her cronies in Oz, I want my Aunt Em and Uncle Henry to move here. And they say, okay. So they move them there, put her in a little cottage because it's too fancy to be in the Emerald City. So she, she takes care of her family, which is a wonderful, wonderful thing. I think that kids would really fantasize about being able to do when they were really unable to do that. Uncle Henry's going to lose the farm because Anna and Uncle Henry were really old and uh, they didn't have any, they didn't have a bunch of farm hands. They were managing this farm in Kansas on their own. This is the land of Oz in the center and all the other kingdoms around Oz. So you see Ix and Noland and Ev and Boboland and Highland and Lowland and all of those different places, the Valley of Mo and all and Rinky Tank. <clears throat> and, it, and then there's an ocean around it called the Nonestic Ocean. And this is just the map of Oz. So, you know, if you're a munchkin, it's the blue section and uh, the Emerald City is in the middle. And you can see those yellow roads, those are yellow brick roads that are going into the Emerald City. And um, if when you talk about ardent fans of the Wizard of Oz, they divide the United States into the quadrants of Oz. So if you're from, like me, Connecticut, you were a munchkin. And so I used to go to the munchkin convention when I was a kid from the International Wizard of Oz Club. So let's go on here. So here's some of the other books that Oz wrote about other lands in, uh, that Baum wrote about other books in, in uh, other um, lands around the land of Oz. So Magical Monarch of Mo, Queen Sixty of Ix, Dot and Town of Maryland, John Doe and Chip the, Chip the Cherub, and they all live uh, in these lands. On the other side of the deadly desert, which seals Oz off from the rest. In 1897, Baum wrote his very first successful children's book. It was moderately successful. It was called Mother Goose and Crows. 
And so this is three years before the Wizard of Oz. And he realizes that this writing gig is working for him. And so he wrote this book and it was illustrated by somebody really famous. Anybody tell who the illustrator was? Close, but not right. I'll give you another hint. Huh? Oh, that's a good quote. That's also a guess, but this was an American illustrator. I'll give you another hint. Anybody know? Yes, Gerald got it. He gets another, um, another ticket. It was Maxfield Parrish. Maxfield Parrish, the, the brilliant um, Art Nouveau and uh, illustrator and magazine illustrator. And this was his first book to illustrate as well. And they made, it made a lot of money, but uh, not as much money as The Wizard of Oz. The Wizard of Oz was an instant bestseller when it came out in 1900. And Maud, <clears throat> Maud Baum, sent Frank to go pick up a royalty check because she's going to be money. And she said, go to, the, go to the publisher, get your royalty check. It's going to be about $100. And $100 was a lot of money in, in those days. I mean, if you think about the average price of a house in 1900 was about $1,000. So this is a tenth of the value of a house. So she's really saying, you got to go do this because we sold a lot of books here. So he goes to get the check and it's for 3,400. That's about $350,000. So if you just went, you know, you went to your employer and they said, oh, here's your wages. And it was $350,000. That's what it would be like if you were uh, the, the bombs at that moment. And so everything changed for them clearly. And it was significant. He produced short stories and comic strips and an Oz book at Christmas every year until his death 19 years later. He had a silent movie company. And here are some pictures from some of his silent movies. Um, and actually that caused him to go bankrupt a couple of times because he was pushing himself too far. He wanted to, to do things other than just the books. The, I was going to show you a clip from this movie, which is um, The Scarecrow of Oz. It is so dull <laughs> that I just like, you know, it's silent. And all it is is sort of people falling over each other and the scarecrow falling down and then yelling at each other and punching each other and pushing it. And it's all things like that. But that was such a novelty in those days that it was very exciting. It's, it's an hour long, as a matter of fact, with all those things in it. When Baum died in 1920, uh, well, he died in 1919, actually. In 1920, a young woman named Ruth Plumley Thompson, who lived in Philadelphia, took over the series and she wrote another 22 Oz books, one coming out every year. And, um, and, and th this was considered for kids those days, people would get these books every single year. So everybody knew about this. Trisha's dad was born in 1896, our grandmother, um, was born in 1896 and they, by, you know, when they were five years old, they get The Wizard of Oz and then they get a new Oz book every year, even though they were expensive because this was a big deal. And The Wizard of Oz was illustrated by a guy named W.W. Denslow. And here he is, he's kind of a, a eccentric guy. But he ended up having a falling out with L. Frank Baum over one of their um, plays. It was a production that they came out. And so they never spoke again, and they got a new illustrator. This is one of the illustrators by Denslow, illustrations by Denslow. And this is actually of Roycroft, the famous furniture designer. And uh, he was involved with the Roycrofts. And if you look over here, that is his signature with that seahorse in it. So if you ever see that, that means it's W.W. W. Denslow who, who, uh, who did that illustration. It's very interesting illustrations. They're not my favorite illustrations, and they're certainly not my favorite illustrations of Oz, but they're interesting. Um, with his Wizard of Oz royalties, Denslow was able to buy an island uh, off of Barbados, and he'd actually moved there and lived there for the rest of his life. These are some of his illustrations. So this is Dorothy, you see that seahorse indicator. There she is again, this is Dorothy, and they're a little playful and, and childish, I think, in a lot of ways. But after the, he stopped, as he just did The Wizard of Oz, John Arneal picked up the rest of the series. And he also did all of Ruth Bormann Thompson's books and his own books. He did some of his own books about Oz as well. And they call that the fabulous 40, 40 books in a row, all about Oz. John Arneal was an Art Nouveau illustrator who produced about 100 drawings per book amazing stuff. And, and he did that for the next 35 books, including significantly gender diverse interpretations 
of Baum's characters. So here's his first picture that appears in Land of Oz, of, uh, I mean, in, uh, in Ozma of Oz, of Dorothy. You can see how different Dorothy looks in this. For one thing, she's wearing a much more contemporary dress. She also has blonde hair. And there's Belina, the chicken there. There's Dorothy with TikTok, um, TikTok the, uh, the uh, clockwork man. And here you can see she's a much more sophisticated drawing. And there's much more of that Art, New, Art Nouveau feel, especially if you look at the, um, the swirling uh, nat natural look in the, um, the lion spur. That's the cowardly lion that she's sitting on. And this I is have those books here. Huh? What'd you I say? have those books, those specific ones that you're showing. Well, I have them. Well, good for you. Yay. Mm -hmm. That was Mary and Lavendier, and she's, called, she's talking to us from uh, Nevada. Las um, Vegas, yes. Las Vegas, hey, that's the, the heart of Oz, um, Las Vegas. is. So in this particular story, this, this is a hilarious um, picture, I think, in a lot of ways, because there's Dorothy. This is called Road to Oz. It's from Road to Oz. And this guy is the shaggy man, and he's an Oz character, and he shows up in, in lots of books. But he looks like a tramp, okay? And she's sitting on, this is like a kid's book. So she's sitting on this fence in front of the farm, and he comes over and he says, uh, can you tell me how to get to this town? And she says, well, yeah, it's, I, I can show you how to get there. And he says, oh, look, here's the love magnet. And the love magnet makes everybody love me. And she says, oh, yeah, I see what you mean. This is OK. Yeah, I sort of look. And he says, well, can you show me how to get to this town? So she says, OK. They start, they walk away together. She walks off. She's 10. She walks off with this tramp guy. And they suddenly can't find their way back. And they walk all the way to Oz together. But I don't know that this is the perfect thing to tell a 10-year-old to do. When you see this guy, yeah, sure, go ahead and go with him. Because uh, he has this magnet. Um, so they get to Oz. <clears throat> and there's, Dor there's Toto. That's Toto that's pointing at the statue of uh, Dorothy from the Wizard of Oz era. And you can see at the bottom of the statue is Denslow's signature. And Toto's laughing at the, like, look at the way he drew you. <laughs> it's because it's, she, she doesn't look so sophisticated in that. She's sort of queer, querying that as well, um, that John O'Neill did. So <clears throat> every person in the United States from 1900 on, every person knew Oz. And I think that's been true for 100 years and 120 years. And they knew every character. They knew all the characters. Um, Baum produced a musical of The Wizard of Oz that ran for over 100 performances on Broadway. It started in 2002 or 1902. And then the roadshow went on all over the country everywhere. It probably came here to the Lehigh Valley because that's what road shows did for people's entertainment. You know, you couldn't watch TV. So um, that gave people, gave people opportunity to learn about Oz through this and to match it to the books that they were all reading. There were Oz toys. This is a poster from the, um, from the actual uh, play. There's this game. So this game is from about 1925. And this is a really cool game about Oz. There's the front cover of it. So it wasn't just around when the book came out. It wasn't just around when, when the Wizard of Oz movie came out in 1939. Everything and continuously all of these things happened. There is uh, uh, the woozy. That's the, what the, the, that was a character that bought, uh, Bob came up and he made all these toys of the woozy and people bought these toys of that. This is something from 1925. This top is from 1925 as well. And um, this Wobble Book game, that was, Wobble Book was a character in the second book <clears throat> that came out at that time as well. And there's more toys and John O'Neill created this Oz toy book. This was his radio show company. Um, they had radio then. And Jello, you could get Jello. Who knew that you could get Jello in the 20s? Um, you could. And this cool pin, which I wish I had one of these pins. They're so cool. I wear it all the time. Um, <clears throat> and then in 1925, they had another, a better movie. You can actually see this movie. It's still silent. But um, here's another potential for quiz question. The guy who's playing the um, scarecrow is a guy named Larry Seaman. But this guy, does anybody know who's playing the Tin Woodman in this? Let's look at a close-up. Who is this of his face? Oh, 
No, not a bad guess. That guess was W.C. Field. But he is a member of a comedy duo of the same period. And he's the fat one. Oh, yeah. It, who was it? Oliver. Oliver Hardy. Yes. Who said Oliver Hardy first? <laughs> okay, there we go. I think we got this. Back. You get a ticket back there in the back row. There. Yes, it was Oliver Hardy, Laurel and Hardy. And he wasn't working with Stan Laurel then. This is Oliver Hardy. And he was playing with Tin Woodman in this in 1925. <clears throat> um, in the 1950s, these juice glasses came out, these terrific juice glasses, which um, have all the different characters of Oz. And by the way, this is my collection, mine and Trisha's collection. And this is our Christmas table where we're all drinking out of the Oz juice glasses. <laughs> Um, which we have a complete set of, by the way. Um, and so, so we love that. And Trisha, Trisha and I use those every day. This is my Oz book collection. Um, and it's serious, serious business. I've been collecting these books since, uh, since I was 13. And, um, but I don't have a superlative collection. I have an average collection of every single one of the Oz books, but uh, not really the fanciest. So the Wizard of Oz books, the Wizard of Oz, was and other of in the series were banned and they they were banned then and they're still banned today so let's think of some reasons why these books were banned can anybody say raise your hand witchcraft, witchcraft is exactly right witches but what does that mean what do you mean exactly so you, you can give allison a prize but it's not just witchcraft because they had good witches it wasn't the bad witches because they get their comeuppance it's good witches. How could there, you know, how could you be a religious Christian person and think that there could be good witches because witches are inherently bad? And they were banned, the books, and they still try to ban the books because they have good witches. Also, animal, do anybody have any other guesses? Uh, here's one. Uh, I'll give you this. This is actually a reason that they were banned because animals can talk. And, and that's the kind of thing that the devil makes happen. They also have human characteristics. They're, they can be cowardly or they can be uh, sweet. One of the cool things about Oz is that humans don't kill animals to eat them, even though they eat meat. They just kind of use magic to get them. Um, even animals avoid killing other live beings to eat, even though they want to. Um, this is another thing. The political economic structure of Oz is profoundly socialist, providing food, housing, autonomy, and protection for all people and all animals, which is cool. It's a very positive thing. Anybody else guess another reason why? Yes. Because there's an unmarried female going around with like males. Well, that's could okay. I'll give you that. Sure. I think one of the things is that women are totally in charge. Uh, if you think about Oz, the people who run it. The protagonists, the big protector, who is Glinda, are all women. Men are humbugs. They're animals. They're made out of other stuff like tin, copper, straw, pumpkins, potatoes. <clears throat> and they don't have a big, big uh, part in it. Um, and it's sort of interesting that Alfred Baum had four sons, um, but he did do, choose to do. OK, so here's a big quiz question for you. Is Glinda the good witch? The, is she the good witch of the North? Or the good witch of the south. Wrong. Wrong. No. You know the answer? No. Nope. Glinda in the book is the witch of the south. In the movie, she's the witch of the north. So she's both. She's both. She isn't real. She's there is a different witch of the north in the book. Her, her name turns out to be Taddy Poo, which is kind of a weird name. But um, she is, if you read The Wizard of Oz, it's not going to the North. Um, but in the, in the movie, she is the Witch of the North. Just to be extra confusing. Um, okay, so let's look at, uh, this is the second book of the series. This is The Land of Oz. And this is just so queer. Uh, this caused this book to be banned, something that, about queerness. And there's a spoiler alert, because I'm going to tell you the story of this. So what's the main character's name in the Land of Oz? Does anybody know the protagonist's name in that? Anybody know? I gave you a hint. There's, there's this picture, it's a boy. And there's his picture. His name is Tip, Tipitarius. And uh, he, he starts out with his story and he is being brought up with 
and kind of a slave to mom be the bad witch. So even though Dorothy got rid of the other witches, they're still Mombi, who's an evil witch. And Tip has to live with her. <clears throat> but Tip is a wily guy and he does interesting things and he, he wants to scare her. She's off uh, buying some, or, you know, trading some magic with uh, Dr. Pipt. And so Tip makes a giant pumpkin headed man it just out of some pieces of wood to scare her. It doesn't, it's the, it's just like the stand up in the, in, and to scare her when she sees it. But he gets the powder of life, which Dimanthi has, and she brings Jack Pumpkinhead to life. And so now he is an animated character who is essentially a character who ends up being a continuing character through the rest of all of the books. Jack, Pumpkinhead calls Tip father for all of the rest of the books. And it says that, you know, my father. And that happens sort of in Return to Oz, if you've seen that creepy movie, The Return to Oz. Tip has adventures with the sawhorse, who he also brings to life. And um, I can't see the ornaments. Let's see. The scarecrow, the wag of bug, and Belina, who's a chicken. Um, is it true? Belina? Yeah. And, and the wobble bug, which is a giant bug, <laughs> which you'll see. And here he is with the, you know, all these guys, the top Oz guys that he's hanging around with. And he wanted what he's doing is, and there he is with Jack Pumpkinhead. He's going to see um, the Tin Woodman and the Scarecrow is being, uh, is, is, has lost his control of the Emerald City. And so Tip is trying to help him. And if you look up here, um, and Tip is going to fight to help the Scarecrow regain the Emerald City. And in the end, they go to, Glinda, and they ask for help because she's the one who's all powerful. And by the way, she has an army of 50 beautiful girls, which is pretty fun if you think about it. And she points out that it's going to point out that the wizard and the scarecrow are not the legitimate rulers of the Emerald City. There's actually a family hereditary line. And, um, and in this picture, I love it that the scarecrow is kind of, or the uh, pumpkin head is kind of given one of those fourth wall looks like he's looking into the camera because he want, really wants us to get a room to the uh, <laughs> scarecrow and the uh, <clears throat> fourth wall. Um, so there's Tip and he's working on uh, uh, with these guys to help uh, to help regain the kingdom. But Glinda tells them, you know, that's not really legit. There's a wobble bug there sitting at this table. So they ultimately capture Mombi, and this is her soldiers. This is Glinda's soldiers, and. This is what happens. I've just encapsulated the entire book for you. The wizard brought to me, so this is Mombi speaking, and she says, the wizard brought to me the girl, Ozma, who was then no more than a baby, and she and begged me to conceal the child. That's what I thought, declared Glinda calmly. What did you give him for thus serving him, for thus serving him? He taught me all kinds of magical tricks he knew. Some were good tricks and some were frauds but I have remained faithful to my promise. What did you do with the girl, said Glinda. And at this question, everyone bent forward and listened eagerly for the reply. I enchanted her, replied Mombi. That's Glinda. That's the way Glinda really looks. The Billy Burke thing, not right. This is the way Glinda really looks. And this is the Wogglebug, who is, is a, a character who's traveling around with Tip. And there's uh, the sawhorse and the uh, Jack Pumpkinhead who are his compatriots that are working to do in this book. And so Glinda says to Mombi, in what way? And Mombi says, I transformed her into, into what? Demanded Glinda as the witch had stated. What was it? What was it? What did he, what? Into a boy. Into He a was Tip. It was Tip. It was Tip, said Mombi in a low tone. A boy echoed every voice. And then because they knew that this old woman had reared Tip from childhood, all eyes turned to where the boy stood. Yes. How about this in 1902, that a girl was, a uh, boy was, or a girl was turned into a boy. How about that? And so Tip's kind of pissed off, gotta say. He's, he's the look at his face. He's not so cool about this. And so, um, yes, said the old witch, nodding her head, that is Princess Ozma, the child brought to me by the wizard who will stole her father's throne. That is the rightful ruler of the Emerald City. She pulls her finger at him. I, says Tim, 
in amazement. Well, I'm no Princess Ozma. I don't want to be a girl. <clears throat> and here's the Tin Woodman, consoling Tip, who's pissed. He's really pissed. Never mind, old chap, said the Tin Woodman soothingly. It don't hurt to be a girl, I'm told. And we will all remain your faithful friends just the same. And to be honest with you, I've always considered girls nicer than boys, which I have too, by the way. <clears throat> And, and 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 just as nice anyway, added the scarecrow, patting Tip affectionately upon the head. And so they change her back into Ozma. And remember that she has been changed against her will into a boy um, without any consultation. And then Jack Pumpkin says, well, if you change into a girl, you can't be my dear father anymore. It's true. Well, maybe not. Anyway, this is the way, oh, I, I did want to say that that drawing of Ozma, which is the first drawing of Ozma, I hate that drawing, but I like this drawing. Look at this look on Ozma's eyes. Come hither, look. She looks so hot in this. And um, whenever you see Ozma, she's always got uh, that Oz thing on her head and she's got these flowers on her ears. And from then on, no one, and Ozma is absolutely thrilled to be a woman again, to be a girl. And she never, and no one ever uses Ozma's dead name. There she is again. Um, no one ever misgenders her again. There she is, a little plumper. Um, they use her current pronoun when they talk about her past, which is what we're supposed to do, which is exactly what we do. When we talk about somebody who's transgender's past, we use their current pronoun. But Jack Pumpkinhead does call her father in future books. He does. And this is Ozma, and Ozma is the queen of Oz, and also the most beloved character, the most beloved character by all of the people who read the stories in the International Wizard of Oz Club, even though she's trans. How cool is that? Or because, perhaps. No children's book had ever done this. And if you think about it, it's pretty rare today in terms of the main character of a book having this kind of experience. Very, very significant, and needless to say, Libraries banned it all over the place because of this. <clears throat> Ozma still plays and running and jumping and hiding, but she is the ruler of Oz and she does very serious things. She plays with her friend Dorothy. And here, this is, I love this picture. And this is one of the pictures that you can win in the raffle because these are the powerhouse. Uh, these women are the powerhouse of Oz. Glinda, Ozma, and Dorothy, they run the country. And so cool that they're sitting there having a little breakfast, you know, outside the Emerald City. This one is Dorothy. I'm not sure what John Arneal is doing here because she's kind of dressed like Ozma, but she's holding Toto, so it must be Dorothy. And there's Glinda, uh, Glinda with another little kid. And that little kid, I believe, is Betsy Bobbin. And um, Glinda, this is the way Glinda is really supposed to look. And for some reason, there are often pictures of these women kissing each other in very romantic ways. And I'm not even sure who Glinda is supposed to be kissing. I guess this is Dorothy. Not quite sure what's going on there. But uh, this is John O'Neill doing these drawings. Now in Ozma of Oz, Ozma, in, in the, the Ozma of Oz is the third book. There's the lunchbox tree. And that's why we had the lunchboxes tonight. So those of you who are watching on Zoom, Trish made wonderful, wonderful food, and they're all in little boxes that look like this, and they're lunch boxes. And so in the story, uh, 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 Dorothy gets to, this is her first journey back to Oz. She's with Belina the chicken, who can suddenly talk, of course. And um, she's an Ev, actually, uh, before she crosses the deadly desert. But she sees this tree, which I think is like the coolest thing ever, that you would just like be walking along, gee, I'm kind of hungry, and there's a bunch of lunch boxes. And in her, um, in her lunchbox were these things, a ham sandwich, sponge cake, a pickle, a piece of cheese, and an apple. In those days, in 1900, pretty much every sandwich was a ham sandwich, interestingly enough. And um, there was also a dinner pail tree right next to it. And she picks a bunch of dinner pails so that she can take them with her so that in case she gets hungry. And all these things are in the dinner pail tree, which I think is really great. Sometimes they're not quite ripe. So she'll say, it's not quite ripe, so I can't eat the cake. But, uh, but all of these things look so great, including the lobster salad. How about that? Slices of turkey, lemonade, custard, strawberry. I'm not so wild about the cold tongue. But uh, orange and strawberries and cracked nuts and raisins, which she keeps later. And this is 
Return to Oz. This is actually the movie Return to Oz that came out in 1985. And this is a Disney movie, which is very scary. If you've ever seen it, it's amazingly culty and scary. There's some great parts in it. But this has this thing in it. And Dorothy is, is there. She actually has made it to Oz in, this, in the story. And she sees the lunchbox tree and there's the boxes. And she picks one and has, uh, has lunch from it. I think it's a wonderful imaginative thing. And if you think about poor kids in, in, in 1900, kids were very poor. There was a time of a recession and depression. The kids could think that you could just find a lunchbox tree would be the coolest thing ever. Dorothy had queer friends. Here's one of them. This is TikTok. TikTok is a clockwork man and actually probably the second robot-like mechanical figure who is a sentient being in all of American literature, in all of literature. Um, there was only one other one that was sort of on the prairie, but he was an asexual neurodivergent sentient mechanical person who does not feel emotions, but is a loyal friend. And here he is again, he has to be wound up and Dorothy has to wind him up now and then wind up his speech and his thought and his movement. And here's a gender neutral uh, looking character is actually button bright winding him up, winding up TikTok. Um, now in this picture, this is in Road to Oz, and this is Polychrome. Polychrome is the rainbow's daughter, and she comes down the rainbow. Sometimes she slides down the rainbow by mistake because she gets too close. And she's meeting Dorothy in this. And this is a significant moment because what she, she meets Dorothy, and Dorothy's traveling with a bunch of different pe people and creatures that are very diverse and different looking. And she says, upon meeting her traveling companion, she exclaims, you have some queer friends, Dorothy. And Dorothy says, the queerness doesn't matter so long as they're friends. Now, some people, this came out in about, uh, about 1907 or 8. But remember that people were reading these books straight through, all the way through into the 1950s, 60s. Today, you can get these books today. And people believe that Friends of Dorothy came from this line. Now, people think that it comes from other things, too. There's a lot of other things that support this. But this particular line can be traced back to people saying, yeah, friends of Dorothy, because you have queer friends. Yeah, it doesn't matter as long as they're friends. Well, it doesn't, for heaven's sakes. <clears throat> now, in Ozma of Oz, Dorothy meets Ozma. So here she is with Ozma. There's Dorothy in the background and, and with Ozma. These are beautiful. This is a beautiful John Arnie's nail drawing. And they become really, really good friends, according to particularly John Arneal. So if you look at these illustrations, there's a lot of pictures of them that look like this, really, truly look like this. And, and this seems to be happening a lot in the John Arneal drawings, which, of course, from a queer perspective, is sort of attractive. And fan fiction has picked up on this. You can see this fan fiction these fan fiction things as well. And you can see these, these are by Rex Shadow, um, who picked up on this uh, because it's all through the books. <clears throat> so John Arneal also has a lot of gender neutral images. This is Button Bright and uh, Ojo, uh, who was a character, but Button, Ojo is a character in um, Patrick Girl and Button Bright is a recurrent character who's kind of a dopey little boy who never says anything other than don't know when you ask him any question. He's always lost. And then you say, Where, where's your mom and dad? He goes, don't know. And he says that. Um, but in these particular pictures, this John O'Neill has drawn them with outfits that are very gender neutral. Let's put it that way. Now, this picture over here is Pond the Gardener boy. But in this, he's wearing what looks like a dress and, um, and kissing this girl. And he's always wearing these clothes that are sort of very effeminate looking. And this, this is not typical of the day. These are not typical images of the day, but for some reason that John Arneals is drawing these as very gender neutral characters. This is Wood the Wanderer, Wanderer who's also uh, who's in, uh, I can't remember which book this is <clears throat> in, and he's another boy character. But the boy characters frequently look like girls and there's, there's no question about it. He didn't have many boy characters. He had about four major boy characters. And they all sort of have this gender neutral look to them. This is Ojo again, with that girly look, how to say. This too, this is, uh, this is Woot, I think. And this is um, 
Pi, who was in Rinky Pink of Oz, and also again, that sort of, of feminine look to them. And then with the girl characters, this is Betsy Bobbin, who have, they tend to have, often the girl characters have uh, a look that is gender neutral as well. And then there's this, which I just thought was a George O'Keefe moment. <laughs> this is Trot and Captain Bill. And I, you know, artists never make these by mistake, I gotta say. Um, <clears throat> so more seriously, in the, in the late 1800s, uh, Baum, who was producing a newspaper and then he created this newspaper, he wrote two editorials that have been seen to be anti-Native American. And I really wanna address this because critics of today point to them as evidence of Don Baum's bigotry toward indigenous people or people of color, but these critics totally miss that L. Frank Baum wrote these editorials steeped in part sarcasm, which he employed in much of his writing. I have read these editorials and there's only two and they're both about uh, Native Americans and one of them's about Sitting Bull's death. And to me, and, and I didn't, they're long, so they, you know, I didn't include them all here, but if you read them, you can read them as very sarcastic. You can also read them as very anti-Native um, American. But at the end of one of the editorials, he wrote, when the whites win a fight, it's a victory. When the Indians win it, it's a massacre. Well, that's condemning the double standard of white supremacy. And I think that was true. In fact, his chosen religion was the theosophical, that word, theosophical society, which is top principle to form a nucleus of universal brotherhood of humanity without distinction of race, creed, sex, caste, or color. That's very, very progressive for the day. And he was committed to it. And also remember that he was absolutely committed to um, Matilda Gage, who fought for the rights of Native Americans uh, as one of her most important uh, efforts. Bottom line, don't write something that could be seen as an extremist opinion and expect critics to understand 100 years later that you are being sarcastic and meant the opposite, because I think that's the case. Here's an example. Molly Irvins, the wonderful, progressive, uh, uh, incredible uh, writer, Molly Irvins, who wrote very, very critical things of the far right. And she wrote in a column one time, this paragraph. But let me read it the way somebody a hundred years from now could read it. Gay marriage, now there's a crisis. Well, okay. So there isn't much gay marriage going on in Texas. None, in fact, first. First, we made it illegal. Then we made it unconstitutional. The President Bush is concerned about it. So I guess we have to alter the US Constitution. You could read it that way, but that's not what she meant at all. It was completely sarcastic. And then in, in, in 2006, Trish and I went to, we were antique dealers and we went into New York City. We saw a friend of ours who was an uh, antique dealer in Sam Strauss, and he, he said, did you read that really anti-gay thing that Molly Irvins wrote? And I said, what are you talking about? And he said, well, this thing. And I said, this, this, this is sarcastic, this is sarcastic. She said, he said, no, she's saying we, that, that we should alter the constitution. Remember the onion, how people believe it all the time? That's, I think that's what happened with regard to L. Frank Baum. I don't think he was a, a bigot at all, particularly for the day. Now, mainstream publishers of the day refused to allow positive depictions of people of color, and Baum occasionally sneaked in smart, creative characters whose bodies were other than white, like John Doe, like the Patchwork Girl, and even the Scarecrow. Here is the Patchwork Girl, and her name was uh, Scraps also. This is her book. There she is with Ojo. The Patchwork Girl of Oz. So let's see the Patchwork. This is one of the great things about her. She says, I hate dignity. Now, if you look at her face, you could imagine that she was drawn in a way to indicate that she was not white. And one of the reasons that might support that was that she was created as a servant for Dr. Pip, who was the creator of the powder of life. There's that powder of life coming back again. Now, he, the Dr. Pip, had intended to give her only a few brains, uh, and well, they would have been the obedience, truth, and amiability and a little cleverness brains. But Ojo, who was also in this story, felt that was unfair. So he gave her all kinds of brains, courage, learning, judgment, ingen ingenuity, self-reliance, posy, which means that she could spout poetry, which she does all the time, and twice the dose of amiability, obedience, cleverness, and truth. And so as a result, 
the patchwork girl throughout the books becomes a brilliant comic observer like fools in Shakespearean um, plays. And she's constantly doing that. She's also kind of a love interest for the, uh, for the scarecrow. He once in a while kind of uh, makes up to her, but, um, but she's not that into it, quite frankly, because she, she hates dignity. The most enduring long-term relationship <clears throat> are these guys, quite frankly. Um, it's th this is uh, 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 the Scarecrow and Tim Woodman, and here they are. This is the guy. The Scarecrow was played by um, Fred. Uh, I just forgot it. Fred Snow. Is that his name? Yeah, Fred Snow. And he he was um, he he and, and uh, David Montgomery, who was the Tin Woodman, played these parts in the in the. Um, 1902 play that was on the Wizard of, that was on the uh, on Broadway, and they were a comedy team, and they were in everything together, not just this play. <clears throat> and they were very very close. They named each other's kids after after each other, and they were and they always seemed to be sort of um, in positions like this. But when you look at John Arndt, and then this is a uh, Fred Snow. And by the way. Um, Fred, Fred Stowe was a, a mentor and, an, uh, and, and uh, Ray Bulger, who played the um, Scarecrow in the Wizard of Oz movie in 1939, loved Fred Snow and thought he was so significant and such an icon that he was originally, Ray Bulger was originally going to be cast as the Tin Woodman. And he said, no, I want to honor Fred Snow so that I could, I want to be the Scarecrow. And he was, of course. Now, if you look at pictures of the Scarecrow and the Tin Woodman together, they're always hugging each other. It just happens in, and they can't keep their hands off of each other in all of these meal drawings. They're always holding hands. They're always holding hands. They're always holding hands for heaven's sakes, or they're snuggling up to each other, or they're, um, you know, they're telling each other serious problems. What are we gonna do? Or they're hugging again. Um, they are really, really committed pals. They never are shown not touching each other and they're constantly hugging all the time. And so there aren't a lot of romantic relationships in Oz books, but this does seem to be one of them. I think this is definitely true. There they are. And by the way, fan fiction has totally picked up on this. And so there you go. Mm -hmm. This is the Scarecrow. This is the Scarecrow and the Tin Woodman's daughter, Patricia, apparently in fan fiction. This is Fred Snow, it's now Shadow again. I think this is hilarious. I just saw this today. All right, let's talk about John Doe and the Cherub. <clears throat> now, John Doe and the Cherub is an Oz adjacent story. Um, they end up living in Highland and Lowland, which is an island in the Nanestic Ocean. Um, and the Cherub is, it's, no, it's just Oz adjacent. And this is Chick, Chick the Cherub. So Chick the Cherub, there he is, or there they are, there they are. This is, this is a Chick. And here's a description of Chick. The child had fair hair falling in fleecy waves to its shoulders, but more or less tangled and neglected. It had delicate features, rosy cheeks, round blue eyes, and then these eyes, when, when these eyes were grave, which was seldom, there were questions in them. When they smiled, which was often, sunbeams rippled over their blue surfaces. For clothing of the child wore garments of pure white, which reached from its neck to its ankles and had flowing sleeves and legs like those of a youngster's pajamas. The little one's head and feet were bare, but the pink soles were protected by sandals fastened with straps across the toes and ankles. Now, this was over a hundred words. What do you notice about it? Gender neutral. Elizabeth gets a, a ticket. Yes, no gender pronouns. No gender pronouns in this entire thing. Where's the ticket person? <clears throat> Falling down on the job. Chick the Cherub is a non-binary child in Oz. Absolutely. There's Chick having an adventure with John Doe. This is John Doe's best friend. John Doe and the Cherub, which was written in 1906, features a small gingerbread man who's John Doe and his best friend forever, an incubator baby named Chick. And that's what Chick says about their life. They say, I'm an incubator baby. I don't have any mother and father and I have no gender. So constantly throughout the books, and this is a 300 page book, people are asking whether Chick is a boy or girl and they never identify Chick's 
gender intentionally. John Arneal pictured Chick as a gender neutral Buster Brown haircut. What did Buster Brown do? Shoes. Who said that? Yes, Allison, you're too good. Shoes. Give Allison a ticket. Buster Brown. There's Buster Brown. He lives in a shoe. And there's his dog Tag. He lives there too. There is Chick with, um, with John Doe. And you can see that little haircut of the day was not indicative of male or female. It was gender neutral. He or she pronouns for chick are never used, though it is sometimes used because Bond didn't get about the uh, using they as a singular pronoun in those days. Um, they probably would have corrected it. But the publishers wanted Baum to resolve the ambiguity, but he refused, very significantly refused in 1906. Riley and Britton was the publisher. And they, con uh, they conducted a contest so that readers could vote on Chick's gender. By the way, people vote on people's gender today, if you think about it. You know, you vote on whether or not a, a, a political party could decide somebody's gender without them making that decision on their own. Um, first editions with the contest page. So this was in the book and on the, there was a page right in the front where people, kids could tear it out and write a 25 word explanation of why they thought Chick was either a boy or a girl, and then they could win prizes. And if you can get one that doesn't have that page torn out, that's a very rare collector item. I do have a copy of this, but it's not a first edition. And this is what it looked like, the great John Doe mystery. I look, kind of love this because there's Chick in the middle, and then, you know, with this dress on the, on the right. But then what's this outfit on the left? I mean, this is so masculine looking, for heaven's sakes. <clears throat> There's a Buster Brown look if you ever seen it. So what was the answer at the end of the um, contest? Is the cherub a girl or a boy? What's the answer to that question? Is the cherub a girl or a boy? Yeah. What was the question? What would what'd you say? Yeah. Yes. <laughs> well, the answer is also no. <laughs> because the truth is, and there's uh, the answer is no. It isn't a girl or a boy. There is no choice. And what actually ultimately happened was they never reported who won the contest. They never said that to, about anything. And then as a matter of fact, in a couple of years later, there was another book that Baum wrote that was Road to Oz. And in Road to Oz, Ozma is having a birthday party. And so all these characters from all over the other books and other lands around Oz come to it. And John Doe and Chick come to Ozma's birthday party, and this is the picture from that. And Chick is gloriously gender neutral in that book as well. Um, so what happens is he, he Chick comes in, and it says Chick shook hands with everyone, including Belina, who's a chicken, and was so joyous and frank and full of good spirits that John Doe's head bullywog. So bullywog is the political or the elected name. Um, because John Doe is now the king of Highland and Lowland, and Chick is the bullywog, which means something. I don't know. Um, but it, I guess advisor. And um, so his, the, uh, the bullywog at once became a prime favorite of everybody in the room. And Dorothy says, is that a boy or a girl? And Button Bright, of course, says, don't know. Because <laughs> that's what Button Bright says. And then, goodness me, what a queer. A lot of people you are, exclaimed the rubber bear, looking at the assembled company, and Button Bright says, sorry you. Mm -hmm. At least the Button Bright didn't say don't know. They are friends of Dorothy. There's that queerness again in there. We love it. And then they fly away in a pink flamingo, which couldn't be more queer, <laughs> I think. The rubber bear is, is a whole other character. You'll have to read the book. But that's very clear. The rubber bear? Yeah. OK. Oh yeah, bears. Okay, you're right. Okay, you're right. Absolutely. I wasn't even. I was still thinking about gender neutral, but you're right about that. And I, I also thought that the pink flamingo that they're flying away on was particularly clear as well. So yay. Now these are the these are um, three of the other people who were very involved in the production of the. There's John Arneal. That's a drawing of John Arneal. There were any good photographs of him, um, and he he wrote a couple of books at the end of his life. It, he did. He was writing three books, and uh, the third one, he actually died before it was able to come out. And the illustrations of the books that he wrote, which were in the 1940s, this is after Ruth Palmy Thompson retired from doing the books, 
they have a magnificent pictures because they're his own books. And then there's Jack Snow, and he took up the series of books and he wrote two books, Magical Mimics and uh, some other one I can't remember. And Jack Snow um, also wrote in the 40s and he was gay. He was a, a, a gay man. Everybody knew he was gay. He had sort of a complicated life. And then um, Dick Martin, who was the next, he was the one who wrote the very last book in the series of the 40 books. He was also gay. And uh, I met him in 1973 when I was a tyke um, at a convention, which at those times, those conventions were very small. So it was in a church basement in New Jersey. My mom drove me there. I was 14. And uh, when I, he was at the door and he was taking, like he, he had to pay to get in a little bit. And years, a few years later, I realized he was gay because he was obviously gay. And he unfortunately died in 1990, which probably means that it was the height of the AIDS epidemic. So I would guess that that was the end of his life. He wrote very interesting books. He made those maps. He drew those maps. But I don't love his drawings because um, they, they tend to be very indicative of the 60s. And that was not a good illustration time. I don't like those drawings as much. But um, anyway, I found Oz because I saw an article in the New York Times and I saw pictures of the, um, of the movie and I loved the movie. And so I read it and it turned out this article by Martin Gardner, who was a famous science writer. And he wrote a lot of textbooks that kids have in junior high and, and, and high school. And he was a big fan of, of Oz. And Martin Gardner wrote this about, and it, it, it said there were other books. And I was like, oh, there's other books. I was so excited. So I went out and, and read those other books. And so in 1971, I would have been about 14. And I'd already loved the movie. And I know, and now I know everything about the movie, every single thing. And one of the things I know is that Judy Garland was already a gay icon, but not gay by 1939 when the movie came out, when The Wizard of Oz came out. She was married to Vincent Minnelli, who was bisexual. He was the father of um, Liza Minnelli. And she knew he was bisexual because she walked in on him while he was having sex with a man. And she talked about that. That's the International Oz Club emblem. And it's been around since the 1950s. And I was a member of it for a long time. And there were some fun things that happened to me. So one of the things is I got to go to a Munchkin convention in 1977, and there's a Munchkin. And I met him, and uh, and he signed my Oz book, and uh, his name is Meinhard Rabe. And what part did he play? No. The yes, he played the coroner. There's the coroner. What does the coroner say? Pretty good, pretty good. You could get a, a ticket for that. Yes. What the coroner says is. As coroner, I will of her, I thoroughly examined her and she's not lonely, merely dead, she's really most sincerely dead. I can do this to the entire movie, so don't get me started. <clears throat> but yes, definitely, uh, she's really most sincerely dead. That's where there's only uh, eight Munchkin speaking parts and he had one of them, he was great. He was also Oscar Mayer and he went around in the Oscar Mayer um, uh, Wienermobile for like a million years and uh, went to the... I could talk about the movie forever. You don't want to hear me do that. And most of you know about the movie. How many of you have seen the 1939 Wizard of Oz movie? Okay, everybody. How many of you have seen it more than 10 times? How many of you have seen it more than 50 times? Yeah, okay. Or if you like me, more than 100 times because uh, it's really ingrained in my. So I'm not going to tell you all about the movie, but I am going to tell you a couple of things to watch for next time you watch the movie. Um, <clears throat> so there's a fabulous, uh, fabulous uh, Wicked Witch of the West, and she is in, has something in her hand, and it oh there it is there it is in her hand. Does anybody know what that is? I thought I gave it away. Yes, it is. The, if the, so that's Dorothy in the picture, and she's being carried by the monkeys. But that hat is the golden cap, which controls the monkeys. And in order, for, and that's why Dorothy's wearing it, because remember, she killed the wicked witch, and she got the cap, 
And now she can get the uh, monkeys to take her back to the Emerald City, which they're doing in this, they're carrying her back to the Emerald City and they're nice to her because the owner of the cat can control the monkeys. And so in this, the Wicked Witch of the West has got the cat and she's holding it. And they actually had a scene called the witch's incantation scene and they cut it out because, uh, but she's still holding the cat. So when you see that, you'll know that when she's, that's why she's got that golden cap in her hand. There's this beloved person. What is her name? What is the name? Margaret Hamilton, who said it? Okay, you go, you got it. Because I love Margaret Hamilton, so you should get a ticket for that. You should get a, a raffle ticket for that. There is a terrific, and then she was, of course, the Wicked Witch of the West. Margaret Hamilton lived her from 1902, 1985. She was 38 when she was on, when she played the Wicked Witch, and she was horribly injured during the uh, movie when she is in Munchkin Land and she goes down and then flames come up. She actually got caught in the flames that burned her hands, but the green makeup, the green makeup got into the burns and caused a horrible, horrible circumstance for her. And uh, she, whenever she talked about her experience, she always talked about that because it was so grim. There she was, she was great. She was a wonderful person. And she was such a good sport. So here she is with Mr. Rogers telling kids that she's just an actor playing a witch. They don't have to be scared. There she is with Oscar the Grouch. There was actually a little episode on Sesame Street where she was there and Oscar sort of gets a crush on her because, you know, she's a witch. And, um, and so in 1982, I wrote her a letter. So this is how I was able to do that. And this is, I had a friend, I was, in, I was teaching college then. And I, I had a friend, I was in New York State, in Western New York State, but I had a friend who lived in New York City and she gave me her old telephone book. And I knew that Mark, because of the Wizard of Oz Club, that Margaret Hamilton lived in Gramercy Park in New York. So I flipped through the pages to look up to see if I could find her telephone number. For those of you who are young, there was such a thing called a phone book. <laughs> And so I flipped through and I found M. Hamilton, Gramercy Park, 38 Gramercy Park. And my dad, who went into the city every day because we lived in Connecticut and he worked in New York City, said, well, Gramercy Park is really small. That must be her. So I wrote her a letter and I wrote her a letter. I was an adult and I asked her if I could take her to tea the next time I was in New York. And here's what she wrote back. She wrote me these three letters. And in the first one, which was in 1982, she said, sure. Sure. When you come to New York, um, the next time you come, I, unless I'm sick or something, I would be happy to go to you. So I was taking some students to New York and I, and when I got there, I had a telephone number. Now in the ancient days before cell phones, you had to call a landline and I called her a couple of times and I couldn't get it. It was very sad. I'm sorry I didn't produce or pursue that more because I think she would have gone to tea with me. She was, she was a great sport. And um, she wrote me a little, uh, she wrote me other notes. I used to send her, uh, I had a lot of art shows in those days and, and I would have information about the art shows and then she'd send me a note that said, thank you for inviting me to the show and stuff like that. She was terrific. Okay, now picture this. 1974, Riverside, Connecticut, a suburb of New York City. A 16 year old teenage girl gets an invitation to a fancy cocktail party as a member of the Wizard of Oz Club in a fancy Manhattan address. My dad actually looked at this and said, this is a really fancy neighborhood, it was Park Avenue. That 16 year old, of course, was me. And, I, and this was in a very fancy apartment house, something like this. So I asked my high school pal, Tom Conroy, who I just talked to yesterday through Facebook, to come with me. He was a really good friend of mine. And there he is in 1974, when we both had much more hair <laughs> in those days. Um, I had really long hair. So we went in on the train. So both of our dads would go into New York City every day. They both worked in New York City every day. So we took the train into New York, you know, just a quick uh, you know, half hour trip in the evening. And when we got there, we got off. This place was so fancy. I couldn't even find a picture that was fancy enough to indicate what this was like. When we went up in the elevator, the elevator opened into the apartment. There was no hallway. We just went there. With, it was their elevator. And there were quite a few people there. They were all from the International Wizard of Oz Club. And they were where, you know, and then there was like maids in uniforms passing fancy hors d'oeuvres around. And there was a huge, huge, uh, uh, there were multiple rooms. And there was a huge, uh, 
grand piano in the middle of the room. And these people were there. So this guy is Ken Harper, and he was a Broadway producer. And this is Charlie Smalls. And he was a person who wrote music for uh, terrific music. Um, both of them died in the, uh, in the 90s. Um, and, and sort of in quirky ways, it was sort of were accidents. But um, Charlie Smalls wrote, wrote ter fabulous music. <clears throat> and Martin Gardner was also there. And Tom said, that's Martin Gardner. He knew him right away. So he went right over and said, oh, I, I, I have your textbook in my, in my class. He also wrote a lot of puzzles. And so we had chatted with Martin Gardner. And Charlie Smalls um, wrote, he's on down the road, and he wrote, he's the whiz. These guys were there in 1974 to see if they could get people to invest money in producing the whiz. So they had this idea for this play. And so Charlie Small sat down at this big piano and he played these songs. He's on down, he's on down the road. I want to have the music to this, but if we had that, then um, YouTube wouldn't show this. Uh, we couldn't put this on YouTube because we'd be copyright issues with the music. Um, and then he played Sweet Thing, Let Me Tell You About the World and the Way Things Are. Uh, and that's from He's the Whiz. And the music was great. And they're selling this to a bunch of people like me and Tom, who are 16. And obviously, we can't invest, but there's some other rich people there. There's definitely some other rich people there. It might be Martin Gardner. And they say that they're going to produce this thing and it's going to be an all black version of the Wiz. And they're going to get Lena Harm to be the Good Witch of the North. And they're going to get Butterfly McQueen to be uh, Butterfly McQueen, who was made in. The, in Gone with the Wind, right, in Gone with the Wind. Yes, she was Prissy in Gone with the Wind. I don't know nothing about birth and no babies. And she, um, and, and she was going to be a major part, too. She was going to be uh, one of the other witches. And I have to say that Tom and I went, yeah, sure, good luck. Because, you know, like, people try to pitch plans for, for musicals and plays, and about one out of a, a hundred actually get there, and then after they're produced, they might have an opportunity, maybe one in 20, where they, where they are successful and they get their money back. But so Tom says to me gallantly, if it makes it to Broadway, I will take you to the play, to the musical. Now I have to say for a year, I could still remember that music because it was so fun. And he had Charlie Smalls was singing it. So they started to try to do the whiz and it wasn't working. It wasn't working in Philadelphia. And so they got Jeffrey Holder and this is Jeffrey Holder to be the director. Jeffrey Holder was the cola nut guy for older people. Remember? Yeah. Um, and he would say, uh, he was actually the one who said, this is the uncola and he was pitching seven up. And so he's on a million commercials, but he was also a brilliant director and a brilliant choreographer. And he re-envisioned the entire show and made it into a brilliant, brilliant piece of, of a, a piece of, of musical theater. And one of the ways he did it was he made everything be dancers. So the cyclone was dancers, the poppies were dancers, the field mice, which is in the book, were all dancers. And so it just made so much more sense. And it was the whiz. There it was. It made it to Broadway. And there it was going to be at the Majestic Theater. That was where it opened. So in the first week, Tom's dad got us tickets. Tom's dad worked at a big uh, advertising company, BBDNO, and he was able to get us tickets right in the first week. And we and there was the cast. There was the Stephanie Mills. Um, uh, let's see. Stephanie Wills was Dorothy. Um, she was young. She was my age. She was actually two months older than I. Tiger Haynes was the Tin Man. Ted Ross was the lion. He was also the lion in the movie. And Hinton Battle was the scarecrow. <clears throat> We went on the third night of the show because still we were afraid it might not fly. You know, shows close in a few nights. So we got great seats. We were sitting right in the front balcony, right in this beautiful theater, not a huge theater at the time, actually. And um, uh, we were the only white people in the audience. And there were probably, you know, several hundred people there. It was the first time in my life that I'd been in a room where there was absolutely nobody else that was, that was white. And uh, we didn't notice it at first. Then we kind of went, huh. 
Um, <clears throat> and that's the way it was. That's the way the, the, the because this was an all black cast and it played that way for a while where it was really just two black audiences. So in the very first part, there's a beautiful set and it's Dorothy's farm in Kansas, you know, and it's all run down and everything. And the very first thing you see running into the set is this dog. And it gets a huge laugh because the dog's white. And, um, and, and they have these amazing stuff. There's Stephanie Mills again. She was absolutely amazing. She had incredible uh, musical range. And the, and the show was magnificent. And it ended up running for four years on Broadway in the first show. And it's had revivals since then. It was a, a top musical, won seven Tonys. Um, it was one of the first major all black cast shows, certainly uh, of this time period. And it was, it turned out to be one of the most successful musicals in history. So it was very, very exciting that that was the case. And we've seen revivals of it since then. And of course, there is also the movie. So, you know, you may not be able to see The Wiz on Broadway, but although they have had many revivals of it, but you can see this movie. Now, the movie has these folks in it. So who's, let's name these people. So who's this? Diana Ross, right? Who is this? Michael Jackson. Okay, smart gal. So now who's this? Yes, who said that? Oh, you're too good. Okay, it's Nipsey Russell is the Tin Man. And this guy I already told you was Ted Ross. If you don't know who Ted Ross is, and I didn't write it away, but he was a Bitterman the chauffeur in Arthur. So you may remember who, who he was. He was a very formidable guy with a great voice. And he was in the He was play. an awesome lion. He was an awesome lion. So there's Michael Jackson. And I have to say that this movie is, is you can see it. You can rent it. You can watch clips from it. Again, I couldn't put any of this on this because they would flag it in YouTube. But um, Michael Jackson is magnificent in it. The show itself is very, very different than the musical The Wiz. The musical The Wiz really follows the book very much, The Wizard of Oz. But the musical The Wiz is kind of all over the place, but it has magnificent dance numbers. So you really have to see those. They're extraordinary. But here's my biggest problem. You know, Diana Ross is brilliant. She's absolutely brilliant. But a lot of people, including me, were uncomfortable with her. Why, why was that a problem? What did people say about her in this role? Huh? Everybody said they didn't like her. Oh, okay. So, so you're saying that her hair wasn't straightened? Is that what you're saying? It's natural. It's natural. Well, that, that's interesting. I, 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 I haven't heard anybody say that. I can see that. <coughs> she was too old. Because she was too old? Yes, Miriam's saying that too. Miriam, we get a prize too. Allison just got it. This was Miriam Love of the Year, by the way. Um, um, she was too old. She was 38 at the time, and Dorothy is not 38. Here's the thing. I don't care that she was 38. The problem that I care about her being too old, I thought that the problem with it is she's playing the part as though she's afraid. She's scared through the whole thing. She's so nervous and jittery and, and she's crying and scared and she's afraid of everything. Dorothy is not afraid. She's not afraid of anything. She's not afraid of lions. She's not afraid to go by herself at 10 years old all the way to see the wizard. She's Famously not afraid. courageous. She is absolutely, you're absolutely right, Miriam. She is courageous. And, and in, in this story, it's about her trying to overcome her fear. And Dorothy is not afraid. And I think that wrecks the story. She's brilliant in singing. She's brilliant in dancing. She's terrific with, with all the other dancers. Don't miss this because it is extraordinary. Um, see it because it's so queer. It is just so queer. You've got to see this movie. It's really terrific. Okay. So if I ever go looking for my heart's desire again, I won't look any further than my own backyard. That was my high school yearbook quote. What's the rest of it? There's one more line, the last sentence in the movie. You're exactly right. You are exactly right. 
<laughs> because if it isn't there, I never really lost it to begin with. Here's the problem. That actually doesn't make any sense. <laughs> How can you lose something that you never really had? It just doesn't make any sense. That's why I didn't use that in my, in my, my quote. Because I thought about it for a long time and I thought, this doesn't make any sense. So I, I went with the first part. <clears throat> I would, this is, we're coming to the end now. I would love you to text to give a, a lovely little donation to the center. And here's some actual hard to answer movie trivia questions so you can get some extra raffle tickets. You ready? Here they go. Allison should be re removed from the ability to do this because she's gotten so many tickets so far. Who was originally cast as the Tin Man? These are hard. Who was the first person, huh? Buddy yes, Buddy Ebsen. Absolutely right. Yes. Buddy Ebsen. Uh, Barnaby Jones. Now, here's the tricky part of this question. Is he actually in the movie? And if so, how? Buddy Ebsen, he played the Tin Man, and they put um, tin or uh, aluminum dust on his face, and he inhaled it, and it made him very, very sick, and they just blew him off. But... Um, but he was on the, the, he was actually in it for quite a while before, um, before Jack Haley took over. Is he actually in the movie? Okay, this is gonna blow your mind, but he's singing, we're off to see the wizard. And if you think about it in your head, because it's in my head, I can hear his voice. When you listen to the first part where they go, we're off to see the wizard, and it's the scarecrow and the tin man, it's his voice. It's Buddy, actually Buddy Ebsen's voice um, singing. And you can, you can tell. Name all five parts played by Frank Morgan. Anybody do that? Uh, the wizard? Uh, okay, I sort of need the name, but all right. Yeah, okay, the fortune teller. We'll give you the fortune teller. Who else? Three more parts. Huh? The Guardian of the Gates. The cabbie. The English cabbie. Cabbie, cabbie, just what you're looking for. Take you anyway to the city. And the soldier with the green whiskers at the, at the palace. But he's not going to let you in. He's not going to let us in. Okay, none of you got that. How many times did the tin man chop the door? Now I have listened to the when I read this one time, I have listened, watched that movie so many times that I could count the chops in my head. They run up the steps and then he says, get it, stand back, stand back. And then he does it. Takes too long. But does anybody now take a guess? Three. It's 11 times. And I can hear it in my head. The last one's a little small. <laughs> <clears throat> Who originally owned the professor's Coat, so uh, AKA the fortune teller's coat. Who originally owned that coat? So he's wearing an old coat, you know, he's, he's out there and the um, uh, Dorothy stops to see him when she's running away. And he's wearing- Frank L. Baum. Yes, who said that? Diana. Diana. Oh, Diane, yes, it was yeah. L. Frank Baum, absolutely it, right. It was, it was an accident. They wanted a rundown coat. They went to a thrift shop and they found his label inside the coat. That's absolutely right. Oh, you're brilliant. You should get a special prize. Yes, he would. And, and actually, Frank Morgan just kind of reached in the pocket, took it out, and there was a label, and it was L. Frank Baum's coat that his wife had taken to the thrift shop. How about that? Perfect. Very good answer to that question. You're brilliant. How about this? Name the three farmhands and their respective characters. Those three shiftless farmhands. Yeah, go ahead. Hunk, Zeke, and Hickory. Yes, Hunk, Zeke, and Hickory. Who played Hunk? Well, Hunk was. Yes. Zeke was. Yes. Hickory's the Tin Man. Very good. Give yourself another ticket. <laughs> Can you stump me with a question? Uh, anybody can ask me one question. We'll do one question because we're almost at the end. And I Who owned answer. the dog in the movie? Who played the dog? Who owned the dog in the movie? Hmm. Okay, well, I, I know that the dog's name was Terry and he was owned by a professional um, uh, trainer. And uh, I don't know, remember the guy's name? 
Do you know what it is? Nope. I don't. Oh, I, just that's so bad. Do. <laughs> I just wondered if you knew. <laughs> I, I don't know. Right now. But that was a good question. Okay. <laughs> Let's uh, let's say let's have a raffle in the auction. So where's the tickets? I'm gonna um, I'm going to um, pick some tickets. So get out your raffle tickets, everybody. So this is what we're gonna do, huh? Oh yeah. Um, could you turn it to, the, the things right there? You just slide it up. Perfect. Oh, very good. Okay. So this is so take out your tickets. Thank you very much. Or you can stand here and hold it again. So, um, so take out your tickets, and and so this is what you're going to do. I'm going to pick five tickets. You can go up to the thing, and you can pick the one you want. That's it. That's the deal. So, but the first person gets the first choice. So here we go. Everybody has their tickets. Oh man, that's only for in person, right? Because I don't think I got any tickets. I think that's true, Miriam. <laughs> okay. The the um, the number is one four one four one. Three, seven, two. Okay, there you go. You you absolutely deserve that since you got somebody back. So go back there and pick one of the prints. Here's another one. Um, <clears throat> one for one, three, eight, six. Oh gosh, oh man. Well, you pray you have a lot of tickets, so let's face it. Okay. So now let's see. Here's another one. Um, one for one, three, nine, one. Who's got three nine one? Is there a name? name? Uh, Bobby something? No, no. Okay. Oh, are you Bobby? Three nine one. Do you have three nine one? You get another one. All right. Here's the one. We'll get two more. That is polychrome. The rainbow's daughter. One, four, one, three, six, nine. Robin, yay. All right. Uh oh, it seems like we're just fixed. Okay, let's see. Um, it's an employee. And uh, one, four, one, three, nine, two. Oh my gosh, it's right in the row here. All right. So you guys, uh, now this is what we're going to do next. Um, I would like the the one of the volunteers to uh, after they've picked theirs, hurry up, hurry up, folks. After you've picked yours, um, please put the fulfill put the ones back so that there's a full set there. And what I'm going to do now is I'm going to auction off your opportunity, and this can be a donation to the center. Please do this. Auction off the opportunity for you to choose one. And we're going to auction off this for money. So, and, and we can take credit cards. If you don't have money, you could send in a check because we know where you live or you can give us cash. So put those other pictures back. And um, so that if they take one that you want, we do have a couple of, of, um, of duplicates. And so, uh, in fact, I would love to take these pictures down here, but, uh, but you know, they're beautiful, beautiful pictures. And most of them are ones that I, or all of them are ones that I've shown tonight, I think. So, okay, everybody's picked ones and they're going to put the ones back and fill that one in. There's polychrome and, okay, that's great. They are going to put, they're going to fill, we have duplicates. So the, the higher, entire set will be resumed so that if you love that polychrome one, you can still get it, but you got to pay now. So here's the deal. Ready? And I want you to bid now. Who's gonna give me a bid? Let's have a bid. Let's have a bid. Let's have about a two dollar bid. You gotta have a two. You gotta. You gotta do two dollars. There's a two dollar bid. Let's have. Let's go to five dollars. Who would bid five dollars for one of these? There's. There's one back there. There's five there. Six dollars. You get six dollars. I get it. Seven dollars. You get it. Seven dollars. Anybody else want to bid for six? Wait, you're gonna say seven. I know what I like. You. <laughs> All right. You can pick the one. If you win the bid, you get to pick the one that you want. Okay, so um, so we're up to seven dollars. Who's got a bid for ten dollars? Anybody got a bid for ten? I got Allison. Who about how about twelve? Give me a bid for twelve. That's Kyle. Who's got a bid for fifteen? Let's go to fifteen. There's 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 uh, 
Miles back there and Allison is on 15 too. So we got two people at 15. Let's go to $18. Who's got an $18 bid? $18 bid over here. Who's got a, a $20 bid? Let's go to 20. There's 20, Allison and Kyle, both of you. How about uh, $22? $22, I'm going to $22 dollars bid. I had two bids for 20. They're both at 20. And so, um, and I think Allison was first. So let's go with a $20 bid. So Allison, you can go pick one for $20. Kyle, you could pick after her, okay? If she doesn't take the one that you want. And then those will no longer be available. And then we'll go back and we'll, we'll take some, uh, some, we'll go again. And so we'll have a little bit lower bid. Carl, go, be, go pick one that you want. Will you pay 20 bucks for it? Go ahead. Go ahead and do that. Does anybody else want to pay $20 and pick one of those? Okay. Well, let's take both of you. Go ahead. Go back there and pick. Um, that's Miles and, and Kim. So scamper like bunnies. Come on. We've got to hurry up here. <laughs> okay. Okay. You got to go pick. They want to look at the art. Well, they should have come here again. Yeah, I'm sorry, it. folks. We can't. We can't mail to you because it'll kill us with this this stuff. I have to say that these are beautiful pictures. You can probably find them all online. Um. Okay. So. Uh, so anybody. So now that that. Let's take another bid. Now we're going to do one more. Um, bid. So who's got a bid for? Let's start at ten dollars. We've got somebody who's going to bid ten dollars. Well, I got. How about that? <laughs> fifteen. We'll go to fifteen. So there's Alvin with fifteen. Now you're at seventeen. You still got ones that you like there. Let's go fifteen. Okay. Anybody who wants to pick up one for fifteen dollars, you certainly may go back there. Do you want? Why don't you go first since Alvin has already had one choice, or or you you have it. And go ahead and do that. That would be, you know, keep track of these people because maybe you should be back there so you can keep track of the there. Um, <laughs> I'm not like doing like five things. Um, if you are purchasing something, can you see me over here? Yeah, those of you who have purchased that, come up and let's rectify that now so we don't lose you. And so if you can come up and confer with Allison about that. Oh. And so we've also had some people on 15 there. Now, this is what we're going to do. Uh, once they're done picking those, anybody can pick one for ten dollars. Uh, you have to get in line, and if you want to get one for ten dollars, you can go ahead and do that. And then that'll be it. That'll be it for the evening. Um, I want to ask people if they have any questions or any of you folks online. I'm going to stop the uh, the Zoom now. Let's see. How do I do that? Oh, I'm going to stop sharing. Is that what I do? To stop sharing your screen. Ugh. Oh, stop share. There we go. Okay. Why did it not stop? Oh, there. And there's everybody. Hi. Oh, there's Genevieve. Okay. So, um, and there's Tim. So now, all of you folks that are on, hi, Michelle. Oh, Michelle. Hi, Michelle Meacham. Um, those of you who are still on the Zoom, does anybody have a question? You can unmute yourself and ask a question. Or anybody in the room have a question? Yes, here's a question. Yeah, so the question is, is there a certain order that you should read the Oz books and the way you should read them is the order that they're written. Because um, really, if you if you read ahead, you think, well, how did Dorothy get here? Or how did, where did, and so like lots of other um, series of books, it's really helpful to read them in order. And it's easy to find that because it's in the front of every book. It just has the 14 books. I have to say that um, Ruth Public Thompson's books are a little, quite a bit more insipid than, um, and they have a lot more boy characters. But uh, I, I, I'm not wild about them, but they still really follow all of the interesting Oz things. So like Ozma finds her father and all sorts of interesting things. Anybody What's else have a question? website? What's the best website to, to find the list and information about the Oz? Well, it's pretty easy to find uh, information in all because I got to tell you, I've been researching lots and lots of stuff online recently. 
So if you look just in Wikipedia, it will have all of the lists, but also the International Wizard of Oz Club has some very, very good uh, websites with information about the books. You can, because all of these books are in the public domain, you can read every one of the books completely online by just Googling their name and you can see all of the pictures. And the pictures are all in, in um, complete, um, um, uh, complete uh, full color. I want to be sure that I get that because there's a bunch of people on here that weren't on before. Let's see, Michelle's on and Miriam. So that was, so what do we have? We have 21, so 22, 23, um, 10, 24. Genevieve was already on. Gina, 25. This is great. Okay, so we got about 25 people online. This is great. Um, so what was the question? Uh -huh. You answered it already. Okay. So, so you can see all of this stuff. Uh, you can read the whole book and you could read it on your phone probably. Um, Project Gutenberg people, you can actually listen to people reading you the entire book nonstop, all the books in a row nonstop. I actually have that. It's 700 pages. Unfortunately, wow, it's not awesome. the best voices, but there's some wonderful people who do the terrific voices as well. Who else has a question about this stuff? I love, I love Oz. And I have to tell you, yes. What started me was, okay, so when I was a tiny child, I saw the Wizard of Oz. Um, I was younger than six years old, a terrible mistake because I was frightened. And the thing that scared me the most was not the winged monkeys. It was the fact that her dog was in danger. That made me so upset. Aww. I hate animal movies. Um, but I remember just being fascinated by the movie, fascinated by the music, fascinated by... And so the movie itself, because you think it's a dream in the movie, but then realizing that you could um, read all of these books. And the books, I love the idea that it's written as though it's a real place. So you can fan, so I'm, I'm I, one of the things I said to my dad right before he died was uh, he said some minister had come in. He was a very, a not, not religious guy. He said not some minister had come to talk to him about heaven. And I said to him, you know, I believe that we all go to Oz after we die. And he said, uh, and I said, we'll all be there. We won't be sick and mom will be there. My mother had already passed away. And I said, the animals will be there and the animals can talk and they'll be, and he said, and he, at first he kind of goes, well, and I said, oh, come on, you believe the minister guy? With the heaven thing? That's made up too. And he said, yeah, that's true. And then he's like, he's so pragmatic. He goes, yeah, well, that's true. And, I, and then he goes, it sounds really nice. And I said, we'll say hi to mom and we'll be there soon. You know, so I think that that was, that I sort of like to imagine this. Trish says, you know, that doesn't really happen. But I said to Trish, in case it does, you need to learn about Oz. And I have said this to Trish, you need to learn about Oz because I don't want you to be button bright, who's lost in Oz and is always found sitting in the middle of the, of the crossroads, digging a hole with a stick saying, don't know. I want you to learn about Oz in case I get there first, you have, or you get there first, I have to find you. And so that, you know, it's always that road picture. So I, I love the idea that some, I mean, even though Frank Baum, uh, when he died, his last words were, now I can cross the shifting sand. And and that's how you get to Oz. You have to go through the deadly desert. So um, Liz, what's your next presentation? My, you know, that's a great question, Miriam, and I haven't decided yet. I I, I have uh, this is actually my twentieth presentation uh, in terms of LGBT and um, queer history. Some of the early ones I I didn't. I don't have, I have them, but I didn't record them. So I want to re-record them and change them a little bit so that I think I'm gonna be talking in the spring about the Harlem Renaissance. I think that that has so much queer aspect to it. I think I'm gonna be talking about, there was a couple of other things that we said that we were gonna do and I can't remember what they were. Now. I like to do art um, and I'm not running out of stuff. But uh, I have to tell you that these last four and all the other stuff, I actually have eight trainings that I have to do in January for LGBT um, cultural competency stuff and awareness. And I can't even think about what I'm gonna be doing in the spring, but I will do them in the spring. And I, cause I love to do them and I love to see you all. And um, it's so great to, to have you. So I'm definitely gonna do the Harlem Renaissance and 
Does anybody have any requests? Yes. I, I did talk about, I would be happy to do that. I have to say that when I did George O'Keefe and those of you, I don't know if any of you came to my really early ones, but they went on forever. And I had way too much information. I too did her in the midst of a bunch of other modernists and each one of them, yeah, I think you were. Um, I think each one of them could have had their own night. And so I, I would like to go back. But George O'Keefe is fascinating, actually. And um, and and the relationship between her and um, Frida Kahlo is pretty interesting because Frida Kahlo wrote her suggestive letters and said things like, why don't you sleep with me and stuff like that. It's kind of fun I stuff. Have, I'm so, yes. Um, but it's not specifically an artist. Okay. If you wouldn't mind listing all of your previous ones, because I think a lot of people that didn't see some of them might, if there's, maybe there's a calling for a repeat on some of them. That's a great idea, Alison. I would love to do that. Yes. Good idea. I will do that. So I'll be working on them. And um, I like the Georgia people. There's, there's so many great images for Georgia people. And, um, and her, her circle was just full of queer folks. So it's very significant as well. Yeah. Well, thank you very much. Oh, yeah. You had a question? I was just wondering. I thought I remembered something about Al Frank Ball having. Written the Wizard of Oz as a commentary on the You know, it's it's really interesting. And I, I was wondering if anybody was going to bring that up. People have said that that was the case. Oh, so this person just asked um, it, that some people have suggested that L. Frank Baum wrote The Wizard of Oz as a commentary on the economic system of the United States at the time. And so, you know, like the scarecrow represented agriculture and the Tin Woodman represented um, mechanic, you know, uh, factories and, and, and the wizard was big business and stuff like that. Michael Patrick Hearn, who wrote the annotated Wizard of Oz, he's one of the most renowned uh, scholars today. And I met him in 1973 when I met uh, Meinhard Ravy. And he had just written the annotated Wizard of Oz. He and I were about the same age. So he seemed like a young guy to me then, and I was too. He says there is no indication that that's the case. And that um, some people have said that uh, Vaughn really wrote from a very socialist point of view, but others' uh, editorials didn't demonstrate that at all. And it had to do with a lot with the presidential candidates he supported. He supported the gold standard. He supported all sorts of different things like that. So, um, I think that that's not the case. I actually think when I was saying that he was a hack writer, he really was. <laughs> he wrote the Aunt Jane's nieces stories as Edith Van Dyne. He wrote the Boy Fortune Hunter stories as Fred Akers. He wrote another of uh, the Sam Steele stories as Captain Somebody. I can't remember his last name. He wrote um, he wrote forty two novels. Um, and in 14 of them, uh, maybe 20 of them were about Oz. And the rest of them were all these other kids' novels. He just whipped them out because that was what he was making him money. And in reality, he was losing money. Ma, ma, too bad that Maude wasn't saying, don't invest in that film company. Don't invest in that play. Just write the books. You're making lots of money. He was bankrupt. He lost the royalties to the Wizard of Oz. So, I mean, think of how devastating that would have been. Um, so, uh, <laughs> crazy. And yet, um, so I don't think so. I think he was just like, he would sit down, he would think, what was I telling the kids the story? Here's some fanciful characters. I'm just gonna write this. He said some very specific things that could reflect on circumstances of, politics, of politics of the day. But those were kind of off. I mean, he was cranking these things out. He was writing like three or four books a year. And I don't think he had time to, to, to really think about that at, at all. I think that it's nice to think that, but it's not. This was a fair story. Yeah. Allison has a question. So, um, so Allison wanted to know if I knew about the Munchkin debauchery movies. There were apparently, during the time of the Wizard of Oz, porno movies with munchkins and somebody dressed up as Dorothy. See, I didn't even know that part. And, and well, they, 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 there's some some indication that that was the case. Maybe, 
I mean, yeah. there's always fun. So. I know, I heard. There's the first time all of Oh, 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 so the munchkins were, together. you know so what? Yeah, okay, so, what, so, that, so that's an interesting <laughs> thing. That, so, yes. So when we talk about the munchkins, um, the munchkins were real midgets. There were about 120 of them. 12 of them were actually children, and the rest of them were little people. And the reason that they had little people was because children uh, were regulated by um, child work ethics, so they could work really, really hard. This was during the height of the Depression, um, and a lot of the um, little people were all over the country. They were the only little person that they knew. So they lived in a little town in you know Akron, Ohio, or something. And Singer Midgets was this was a guy who had a group of midgets that were vaudeville, and they had about 20 people, and he was in it, but then he traveled around the country, this guy named Singer, and he got all of these other little people to come to um, to Hollywood. And they were thrilled. And they and when you read their little <coughs> uh, uh, re remembrances, some of them were famous actors, Jerry Marin, who was an actor. You can see him in our gang comedies and stuff like that. And he was he was in there. He was one of the munchkins. But um, but there were other people that were literally just some kid who, and a lot of them were young too, because they were like really little people, and so uh, really short little people. And so they ended up being um, thrilled to be around that many people who were like them. And some of them married each other. In terms of those wild debaucheries and drinking and stuff. That was something that Judy Garland recounted on a Jack Parr show on The Tonight Show, and it was made up. She just totally made it up just to make this great little story on, on The Tonight Show. And um, she totally made it up. But, but there were definitely circumstances for these folks that were very um, special for them because they were around all of these other People that were like them, and you can imagine, it's like, when do you all go to pride festivals? You know, and maybe when people who've never had an opportunity to do that, and then you suddenly go, oh, this is what it would be like if you if you were in the majority. And so um, it was a fascinating thing. And, I, you know, I, I have read a lot of the things that the, the folks that were marked, because those were the last people who were still alive from, from the movies, because some of them were from the movie, the, the last people who were acted in it. And uh, like my heart, Rady lived to be 92. And when he was in that movie, he was very young. He was about 15 or 16. So um, he lived a long time. But uh, they, they were fascinating. They were, they, there's a lot of fascinating stories about that, uh, that circumstance, the, the whole show. And one of the things that, yeah, here's what I want to say. You can tell that lots of these people are not professional actors. The Lollipop Guild, My Heart Raby, the people who spoke, the Lullaby League, those were professional actors. Those little dancers, they were really those, uh, those ballet dancers, were real ballet dancers of the day. But the rest of them, they never done anything. They're not really singing, it's all piped over. And they had to teach them to dance. And if you watch them, they, the dance is, they just move, I'm gonna stand in front of these, they just go like this. And if you look at them, they're all going like this. That's all they do. They sort of walk around going like this. They're not really dancing. And so um, because they weren't really uh, professional. And uh, it was pretty great, actually, it, it, to have that opportunity. Any other questions? <laughs> yes. How is that um, during the film of the movie, um, somebody got hanged. Yeah, okay. So that's a great question. So Torito just asked that there was a rumor that in the in a scene that a munchkin killed themselves and hung themselves to the back. So here's the story of what actually happened with that. That is the scene where Dorothy and the scarecrow go and see the Tin Woodman and they put oil on him so that he can go away. And as they're walking away, you can see something in the background that's kind of moving and it actually is a really big bird but what happened in the 19 in in a i don't know it was like in the early 2000s was someone insisted that that was a munchkin killing themselves and they took the movie and injected into it a scene that they moved frame by frame to look like somebody was hanging in the back and it was fake it was completely fake and um, 
And what a, you know, like what a, it's sort of an in, in, indicative of the fact that this movie was so influential that you would go to the trouble to do something like that, but it wasn't true. And if you really look at that, there's a giant crane. That's it's it's a uh, bird, a big big bird in the background that's walking around, and that was the original thing. And then they created this this fake overlay of somebody hanging in the background. So no, it didn't happen. It's a great question. Great question. Does anybody else have another question about that? Oh boy, thank you very much, everybody. We will see you in the spring.